Good morning, everybody. How are you? Uh, my name is Sharon Brennan. I come to you from the Counseling Center here on campus. I'm joined by my fantastic colleague over there, Suzanne Nasser. Um, we want to thank you, students and instructors, um, for joining us today as we end and conclude our month's activities to recognize Domestic Violence Awareness Month. We are joined today by our two presenters from the Crisis Center for South Suburbia, Megan McShane and Tracy Curtis. They prepared a really important message for you today. We appreciate you being here. They're going to stick around if you have questions. Um, there's some important resources up here as well as off um, to the side, to the far left here of the circulation desk and check-in desk. Um, and so I'd just like to hand it over so we have plenty of time for the information. And thank you all for joining us. Hi, good morning. I'm Tracy. This is Megan. Um, for time's sake today, we're going to kind of just hit the most important parts, and there may be some slides that maybe we go through a little bit quicker, but like they said, we'll have our business cards that if you have any questions after, you can definitely reach out to me. My phone number and my email is on there. Um, we can hold all the questions till the end. Again, if you have to leave, if you have another class, feel free to email me or call me and we can talk about it. Otherwise, we'll hang around and you guys can ask them. Okay, a couple points about the presentation. Um, for simplicity, uniformity in the presentation, we use she or her as the victim or him and, or he as the abuser. By all means, we are very cognizant that there are male victims of domestic violence as well. So again, it's just kind of for uniformity so we can kind of have everyone understand the slides and stop, uh, not flip back and forth, okay? Um, and also, we want to be sensitive to those of you that are in attendance. This is a sensitive topic that we do cover. If there's anything that kind of triggers you or you feel uncomfortable about, by all means, go ahead and step out, okay? So what is domestic violence? What does everyone think of what is our typical visual in our minds when we think of domestic violence. Lady with bruises on her eyes, maybe sunglasses on, long sleeves so you can't uh, see the bruises, right? Is that kind of what you guys kind of think of? Um, DV consists of a lot more than just physical abuse. So time, sometimes it can be so covert by the abuser that the victim doesn't even realize that she's in an abusive situation. So we're gonna go ahead and jump in and, whoops, we need to go back to that slide, and kind of define domestic violence, both just kind of a broad term, but also what Illinois considers domestic violence. Um, the first definition is a pattern of abusive behaviors in any relationship that are used by one person to exert, gain, or maintain power and control for another person through fear and intimidation. Two important words there, you guys remember, power and control. By Illinois, they define it as any person who hits, chokes, kicks, threatens, harasses, or interferes with the personal liberty of another family or household member. Um, this law, if this has been broken under Illinois law, Illinois defines family members as they can be related by blood, people who are married or used to be married, people who share or used to share a home, apartment, or another common dwelling, people who have or allegedly have children in common or a blood relationship through a child in common, people who are dating or engaged or used to date, including same-sex couples, and people with disabilities and their personal assistance. So does that kind of set a different picture in your mind as far as what domestic violence is? It can cover the whole family. It's not just intimate partner, partner violence that is considered DV. So there are the different types of abuse. Like we said, we usually think of the lady that has the dark sunglasses on to hide the bruises on her eye. So it can be physical. 
One of the important aspects that I want to relay to you all is a couple things about physical abuse. Choking. If someone tells you that they have been choked by a family member, by an intimate partner, that the statistics on that is two-thirds of victims that have been choked will experience, let me rephrase that, two-thirds of victims will experience a near-fatal choking. Okay, so what that kind of means is that if you are choked by your partner, by a family member, that significantly increases your rate of homicide. 750% more likely to be killed by your abuser. Kind of mind staggering, huh? So when someone says that they were choked, definitely put that up as a huge red flag. Okay, the seriousness of it. Some of the other things as far as for uh, physical abuse could be considered is holding the victim captive, preventing the victim from eating or sleeping. This does happen. Why does an abuser do that? Because if you're tired, if you're hungry, you're weak, you don't want to fight back, you're kind of just going to accept what they give you. So that is a very intentional tactic that they will use. Um, let's see, spitting on the victim. Did you realize that people can catch a charge for spitting on you? Okay, that's another one. Abuser driving at unsafe speeds to intimidate the victim and stalking. So these are just a few examples of what can be considered physical abuse. The second one is verbal. This is often used interchangeably with emotional abuse, but there are distinct differences between the two, and that's why they don't categorize them together. In one study, it was estimated that 12.1% of women and 17.3% of men experience verbal abuse. Some of the verbal abuse can consist of using language to hurt the victim. Another one is, this is kind of a common term, I think, that has come across the board um, with the internet, is silent treatment. How many of you guys have heard, oh, they're giving me the silent treatment? Anyone? Okay. That is, can be considered verbal abuse. And the reason why that is, and it can be a little bit of emotional abuse, too, because when you're wanting to talk out a problem with somebody and they're not willing to talk to you and they just shut down, that's your punishment. Victim kind of starts going, oh no, what did I do? What did I do? What did I do? Um, let's see. Denying the victim's feelings and the right to experience their feelings. Oh, you know what? It wasn't that bad. Why do you feel that way? You're so sensitive. Things like that can be considered um, uh, verbal abuse. Emotional abuse, on the other hand, then, is using hurtful tactics to emotionally diminish the victim, manipulating the victim to make them feel like they deserve the abuse, isolating the victim, denying, justifying, or making excuses for abusive behavior. It wasn't that bad. I just shoved you. So the abuser is trying to get you a little off kilter there to make you think, okay, it wasn't that bad, it wasn't abuse. Um, another form of abuse is sexual abuse. That's unwanted touching, demanding or forcing sex, refusing to practice safe sex, and withholding sex as a form of control. Mental, which also can be called psychological abuse, bullying, intimidation, harassment, ridiculing, controlling, gaslighting. Have we all heard that term? That's kind of been a coined term now on the internet. Don't gaslight me. Who knows what gaslighting means? Anyone give me an example? Go ahead. You bet. Yes, that is just kind of like how we said, oh, I didn't hit you that hard. Why are you like that? You're sensitive. You, they want to keep you off kilter 
when they're abusing you because that's how they, here comes these two words again, power and control. That's how they gain it, that's how they keep it, or that's how they try to regain it if the abuser chooses to leave. Um, and then the last one is financial. This one's pretty straightforward. It is just controlling a victim's ability to acquire, use, and maintain financial resources. So if you're married, you have a joint checking account, you're not allowed to have the debit card, you're not allowed to have any credit cards, you're not allowed to work. Why do they do this? The abuser does this for power and control. If you have financial resources and you start to catch on to the pattern of this behavior, you may want to leave. You need money to be able to do that, right? So those are just some different forms, types of abuse that can happen. Okay, so domestic violence is pretty prevalent. I mean, if you start to think about it, now since I've kind of given you some of the different types of abuse other than just someone not getting punched or hit or slapped, it can happen to anyone, regardless race, age, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, religion, or gender. Okay, so again, there's, there's no one that is not in the line of being a potential victim, okay? One in three women and one in four men have been physically abused by an intimate partner. So that's some pretty big numbers. Domestic violence and its impact on society. These are just some statistics to kind of give, give you that solid understanding of just how prevalent it is. United States, an average of 20 people are physically abused by intimate partners every minute. This equates to more than 10 million abuse victims annually. On a typical day, domestic violence Hotlines nationwide receive approximately 20,000 calls. The presence of a gun in a domestic violence situation increases the risk of homicide by 500%. Intimate partner violence accounts for 15% of all violent crime. Intimate partner violence is most common among women between the ages of 18 to 24, which is y'all's group. 19% of intimate partner violence involves a weapon. So a little bit back to the gun violence. Are you guys, is your mind kind of blown by that percentage of five, it increases the risk by 500%? Kind of crazy. It's kind of easy to get guns now. Although intimate partner violence affects people of all genders and sexual orientation, the impact of abuse, including rates of severe physical violence and violence inflicted with a firearm, is predominantly experienced by women with male partners. Why is that? Why do you think the numbers are higher for that heterosexual intimate partner violence? because it's reported. I think that's what we all think of with intimate partner violence. So maybe a man's not gonna report as much as a woman. Maybe it's the same percentage of what they're saying here, but it's not reported. Same sex relationships, not reported. They're not gonna believe me. Nearly half of female Firearm homicide victims were killed by a current or former intimate partner. So this kind of just touches on, everyone kind of, I think, has their ideas of maybe what domestic violence is caused by. These are some of the things that don't cause domestic violence. Illness, genetics, alcohol or drugs, out of control behavior, anger, stress, behavior of the victim, 
problems in the relationship. Everyone has problems in their relationships. It should never end in violence. Domestic violence is a choice. There are ideas of what may can contribute to it, but it is the abuser's choice. So here are some things that domestic violence can be influenced by. Observation of others. You have a little kiddo, mom and dad are arguing. What does that do? That reinforces that type of behavior in that child to where possibly when they grow up, or even not even that, they may go to a preschool, kindergarten, and hurt other children. <coughs> Experience and reinforcement, same thing. Child sees it. We see it as we're growing up. We see it in society. Society now is so violence-oriented that it's kind of reinforcing that violence is okay. Violence is never okay. Um, culture. Sometimes different cultures, you have kind of where maybe the man is the head of the family and it's kind of become norm. Maybe some of the men are controlling. Family. The DV victims that I worked with previously, it was a generational pattern. So they put programs in place that are trying to break those patterns to where that is just a preventative measure that it doesn't continue on through the preceding generations. Communities, schools, and peer groups. How do you guys feel about that statement? You feel as though you could be influenced maybe about some type of abuse, verbal, emotional? So the next slide that we have is what kind of a model that we use as far as that kind of puts all of those manipulative behaviors and abuse tactics to help us maybe try and understand, give some examples. The power and control wheel shows the kinds of behavior perpetrators use to gain, use to gain and maintain control over their victims. DV is never an accident. It is an intentional act to gain control over that other person in the relationship. Physical abuse is only one part of a whole series of behaviors that the abuser uses. Violence is never an isolated incident. I'm so sorry it'll never happen again. I won't hit you, I won't call you names. Other forms of violence are shown in the power and control wheel. That's what Megan would give me because it's kind of hard to see over there. But you can kind of just look through those. It kind of breaks it down as far as emotional, using isolation, minimizing some of the tactics that we used that we talked about on the other slide. This kind of just breaks it down into how the abuser uses those. Is there any questions on that? Questions on any form of the tactics? So next slide is our cycle of violence. The cycle of violence was first described by Lenore Walker in her 1970 work, 1979 work, The Battered Woman. The model can be used when trying to understand the complex dynamics that occur in violent or abusive relationships. So just to kind of take you through here, you usually have an initial phase that's not shown on the wheel, but if we knew someone was abusive, would you guys enter into a relationship with them? Probably not. You're like, wow, that person's a jerk. So there's something, a tactic used, it's kind of become norm again with help of the internet is called love bombing. Have you guys heard of that? Love bombing? Love bombing is a diagnostic term 
though it is used by mental health professionals to describe a form of emotional abuse. Love bombing is when the abuser shows the victim excessive or overwhelming levels of affection and adoration. It can be used as a way of establishing control over the victim. Love bombing is often constant and tense and may make you even feel uncomfortable. Has anyone experienced that? You get text after text, oh my gosh, this person really likes me. They just don't want to be without me. They want to talk to me all the time. They tell you things, you are the most, you're my soulmate, you're the most beautiful person on the face of the earth. Who doesn't want to hear nice compliments? And not to say that everyone's an abuser, not to say everyone's using love bombing, but there is a line. When you kind of start getting that gut feeling, that uncomfortable feeling like, okay, you said this like 15 times, that's kind of making me a little nervous. Listen to your gut, listen to that. That's unhealthy. So that's what they use to kind of suck you into the cycle of violence. The next step is tension building. The relationship is typified by increasing hostility and stress that may be accompanied by frequent arguments and perhaps limited violence. So this is kind of the stage, have you guys heard the term? I feel like I'm walking on eggshells with this person. You don't wanna disturb them because there's kind of just a level of tension there. So this is your tension building phase. Then you go to the second phase, which is acute explosion. The second phase, oh, huh? Right. Acute, no, that's love bombing. They don't put bombing on the wheel though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just a little different perception there. Um, acute is, like I said, you're starting to walk on eggshells. What did I do to make them upset? So I'm just going to just be quiet. I'm not going to voice my opinion on anything. The ex that, I'm sorry, that was tension building. Acute explosion is the phase where the injury is most likely to occur because boom, just what it says, it's an explosion. It is also at this time that the victim is in an abusive relationship may seek some type of intervention or assistance because you're like, what the heck just happened here? The violent episode is frequently followed by a third phase, the honeymoon phase. Love bombing, honeymoon. <laughs> honeymoon is the phase that is characterized by remorse on the part of the perpetrator and hope for change on the part of the victim. The honeymoon phase represents their efforts to repair and normalize the relationship and may provide the victim with hope that the batterer's behavior will change. What did we say? Violence is an isolated incident. Think it's going to change? Probably not. The abuser, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do that. I think I just had a bad day at work. I got this email that just didn't set right with me. Someone kept te texting me and was annoying me. So they're very remorseful for what they had done. Okay. All abusive relationships might not follow this pattern in the exact form. And usually, the more that you're into it, you can go from tension building to the honeymoon phase. You can skip one of the phases, okay? It's kind of crazy because I always said, is there like a school or a university for these people that like teach these? Because most of the abusers use the same tactics. But those of us maybe with not an abusive type mind, we can't understand why. Why would they do this? That's okay. 
<laughs> so characteristics of a personal batter. Um, by no means do we want to say everyone's abusive if they kind of have some of these characteristics. But usually these characteristics, it's a pattern to it that you can see. Extreme jealousy, controlling, isolates the victim. They isolate the victim because they don't want that victim to have any support. They want to break any other relationship outside of their relationship. So someone can't give you that support or say, hey, I don't think he's acting right or she's acting right. Jekyll and Hyde personality in public, they are the nicest person. Oh, I can't even imagine him being like that. He's such a nice guy. What did you do to cause him to have an explosion like that? Go behind closed doors, it's a whole different subject. And I think this is where the misconception gets of it's a private matter. Abuse is never a private matter. We all need to be aware of it. We all need to be proactive with it. Just like one of the examples, and it's probably going to really relate to you guys in your age group, is the Gabby Petito story. There was a bystander that saw her boyfriend hit her, and he called in. Did it stop the abuse and the inevitable into the relationship with her, him killing her? It didn't. But kudos to that guy for speaking up and calling 911. Uh, lack of personal responsibility and account no accountability, kind of the same thing. Denies and minimizes the abuse. Quick involvement. You guys have gone from zero to 60 in two weeks. Let's move in together. Oh, I think I want to marry you. You're my soulmate. They suck you in and they want that quick involvement. Why do they want that? So they can start the abuse cycle. Okay. And unrealistic expectations. They will have very just crazy expectations of the victim, but they don't expect anything from themselves because it's always the victim's fault. Okay. So characteristics that might identify a victim. Again, it's not just the black eyes or the hidden bruises, the makeup over the bruises. A victim may seem just like they have a sense of hopelessness. That's because they're completely just beaten down by that abuser. Low self-esteem, emotionally numb. They are just, they don't know what to even feel anymore. Lack of sense of self. Where did I go? I used to not be like this. I was a strong, independent woman. I was a strong, independent guy. They lose that sense. Denial of the seriousness of abuse. I know we all kind of like watch those Lifetime movies or something like that, and you'll see you know, one about domestic violence, and they say, oh, he didn't mean it. He was just having a bad day. He won't do it again. That's kind of what that is. Living in fear. You hear their car coming, they freeze. Or you're interacting with somebody that's in an abusive relationship and the abuser comes up, puts his arm around because you know he's the good guy. And you see the victim do something like this, just kind of freeze up. Depression, this isn't a healthy relationship. That's pretty darn normal. And obviously the obvious ones, physical injuries. And if the abuser does not take care and try and do some self-care and help herself, which is not gonna happen in this abuse cycle, it can turn into other physical injuries, migraines, GI issues it can start to affect their physical health as well. So if you had a friend that was perfectly healthy and now they're complaining about just not feeling well, hey, we all have sicknesses, and, but it's kind of the pattern. 
I gotta put the pieces together. Okay, we'll kind of go through these next few a little quicker. Um, DV does affect children. Sleep difficulties, increased separation from the victim. They don't want to leave the parent because they're afraid something's going to happen to them. So those are just some of the effects that can have on kids. Things to know about DV victims. The average survivor of domestic violence leaves the abusive relationship seven to nine times before they actually permanently leave. Why do you guys think about that? This is kind of a common statistic I think that a lot of people know. I think they use seven times. There's a lot going on there, guys. You love this person. You don't want to leave this person. You're hoping that they change. Going through that cycle actually causes a chemical bond called a trauma bond. So you're bonded to your abuser. Same neurotransmitters in the brain that addicts have when they use drugs. Same detox of detoxing from that abuser. Most dangerous times to leave or most dangerous time in the relationship is when the victim is trying to leave. The statistics are that women in abusive relationships are about 500 times more at risk when they leave. Why is that? Abuser doesn't want to lose control. She leaves, he doesn't have her to control. Some partners become abusive during pregnancy. The second one, why is that? Upset because maybe it was an unplanned pregnancy? Stressed at the thought of financially supporting a baby, a first baby, another baby? Jealous that your attention may shift away from him or her. Okay, next slide is, these are some of the barriers. Like I said, we talked a little bit about the trauma bond, but these are some of the things as well that can prevent the individual from leaving the abusive relationship. Abuser task tactics for people with disabilities and older adults. Again, you can be anyone, any race, any socioeconomic status, any physical status, you're still at risk for being abused. And these tactics are a little bit different. Maybe they won't give you your meds. If you have an assistive device, maybe they're gonna take away the assistive device so you can't walk. You can't go anywhere. Or I'm gonna tell everybody that you're this, 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 and this. Talking about your disability, there's some things that you don't want people to know. That is something they will use. Here's some other ones. One that we saw a lot in older adults is that mis misuse of power attorney or they try and seek guardianship. And that's usually because of the financial aspect of it. Okay. So as an advocate in domestic violence, it's not our responsibility to question why a victim stays in an abusive relationship the reason they stay is always theirs and not ours. Our job is to support the victim, help them stay safe, and educate them on resources and supports that are available to them. Okay. Illinois does have a Domestic Violence Act, and that's to ensure that anyone that does abuse can be prosecuted either on a civil or a criminal level. Order of protection, I'm sure you guys have all heard about these. These are just a couple of the slides that we're gonna go through kind of quicker. It's just to try, you go to the judge, fill out the paperwork, and if it's granted, then it just tries to protect you from any further abuse. Okay. <laughs> 
Does anybody have any questions on orders of protection? There's two different types of order of protection. One is civil. That's where the police is not involved. So this is a victim. She has finally started to take a stand. She or he wants to go and get some type of protection. We've all heard of protective orders. They're not easy to get. You have to have the paper trail. And the judge, depending on what you present to them, will either approve or deny it. And then there's criminal where the police are involved. Usually when there has been domestic violence and it's run through the courts, police involvement, the victim can usually get a criminal no contact order on them. Three different types of orders of protection. Emergency order, you need that protection right away. They'll grant it for about 14 to 21 days. Interim order is valid up to 30 days. They kind of extend that. And then the last one is the plenary order. It's valid for varying periods of time. With a divorce, it can run from the life of the final decree. Criminal, then there is criminal offense for violating a protection order. It is for the length of defendant's sentence. It can be up to two years for violating. So this is what they're talking about, the violation of the protection order. So the victim has a protection order. How many people have said, it's just a piece of paper, that's not gonna protect me. Where some of that can be true, but there's legal recourse. They can, they can be sentenced to jail or prison for violating that order, which gives that victim more protection. So how can you guys help? Be informed. That's what we're trying to do here today, guys. There's so many terms out there now on the internet, and I'm glad that they're kind of forcing some domestic violence lingo out there into, you know, society. But you need to know the right use of those terminologies. You need to know about education. You need to know about signs of abuse that it's not just physical. Always listen to the victim with an open mind. The victim has been put into a relationship where she has no control. So she needs to be able just to have someone to listen. Guide him or her to community resources. There is a paper up here that you guys can pick up that does have a list of some of the community resources that you can give. Focus on the victim's strengths, because what does strengths do? Strengths gives us resiliency to get through the problem. She's lost all sense of herself. She has no self-esteem. You have to remind her, but you did this. You made it through. Be supportive of his or her decision. Never question the, the victim of why they don't leave because they know their circumstances the best and help him or her develop a safety plan. Very important. So if someone comes up and tells you that they're a victim of domestic violence, let the victim know that you are concerned. Again, listen to them, believe him or her. Some of these stories, y'all, can be extremely, what we feel, completely out of the norm. There's patterns with these people. So don't ever question when someone says, it's not up to us to say whether she's been abused or not. Support their decision to stay, refuse help, and respect their confidentiality. These are just some helpful things that we can say to the victim. <laughs> Compassion, validate feelings, positive affirmations, just giving her that support to maybe give her the courage to either finally leave 
or give her the courage when she has left, when she's probably very nervous, what's going to happen? What not to say to the victim? Me and Megan on, are on the same page about number one. Why don't you just leave? I'm sorry? Question? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, that can just be victim shaming. She knows why she doesn't leave. It's not us for her to question that. There's that trauma bond, the psychological. There may be things financially. There's a whole list of things that could be forbidding her to stay. Maybe she knows she's going to leave, but she doesn't want to broadcast that. Why did you wait so long to get help? Again, not our place to judge. I think you should leave. She doesn't want to be in an abusive relationship. Again, she knows her circumstances the best. She knows the abuser the best. What did you say or do that made him or her angry? And why, why do you just put up with it? Because it's not normal anger. Again, we've got the referral resources up here. Know the resources in your community. The Crisis Center for South Suburbia, where we're at, we offer a lot of services to help protect the victim. These are some other community resources that you can reach out to. It's up here in a handout. Questions? It's kind of, I know it's a sensitive topic. So if you just want to ask a question in private, we'll be here after, or you guys can either call or email me. So thank you. So I just want to give you guys something, a, a phrase that I found kind of really sticks and just for some food for thought. Despite the many obstacles faced by victims, people continue to ask, why don't they just leave? It is time for us to change the dialogue. Instead of placing the burden on the victim to get out of the abusive relationship, it is time that we shift the focus to the person responsible, the abusive partner. Instead of asking why the victim will not leave, it is time that we ask instead, why do people abuse and why is it allowed to continue? Thank you, guys. Are we like? If you haven't already, everyone, if you could please take a quick moment to sign in um, at the table here, we'd really appreciate it, especially to help our presenters, the staff members, and their participants. Thank you all for joining us. Ooh. I used to go 